Good morning, everybody. I'm Nicola Barrett, Chief Corporate Learning Officer at Emory Executive Education at Goizueta Business School. And wonderful to see you all again for Business Over Breakfast. As consumers, we regard product delivery as a really important service component. It influences our shopping decisions um, uh, on online retail platforms. And this has never been more important as uh, over the last couple of years. Delivering products to customers in a timely and reliable manner really enhances the experience um, and company's profitability. I recently bought a, a tree online. That's the first time I've ever done that. It was supposed to be two day delivery. Two weeks later, it arrived. I am hoping that it survives um, and it certainly uh, is influencing, will influence my future um, buying decisions. Here today with us is Romain Choi, Associate Professor of Information Systems and Operations Management at Goizueta Business School. Romain's research uh, investigates how operations strategies create and deliver value in companies' digital transformations. Specifically, she studies how digitization and more specifically data insights can shape how companies compete and operate exploring data-driven operations in platforms, retail, and supply chain. Her research has been recognized by numerous prizes and awards, and she's been widely covered by the media, including NPR, the Financial Times, Fox News, Fortune Magazine, and HBR. Um, before I hand over to Ming, I did, though, want to um, uh, alert you to a few new program initiatives that um, executive education has been working on. I think I told you about the marketing analytics certificate program we just launched um, for those who want to boost their marketing capability. Uh, but we're also working on a new program on AI and machine learning. So it's probably uh, relevant for, for people who are on this business over breakfast. Um, and we are going to launch that in the summer with Professor uh, Jesse Boxstead. And for those of you who might be interested in MBA degree level learning, but without the degree, um, we're offering seats in a number of our executive and evening MBA electives. Most of these are focused on finance and marketing topics, and they all result in a degree credit and a transcript from Emory. So if you're interested in FinTech, mergers and acquisitions, pricing strategies, customer lifetime value, uh, please reach out. Um, these will all be on our website uh, in the next few weeks and classes start at the end of August. So back to business over breakfast. Romain is going to spend the first 30 to 35 minutes sharing her research-based insights, followed by Q&A. So throughout the session, please post your questions in the Q&A box and we'll do our best to um, answer them um, either along the way for clarification or at the end when we've reserved time um, to get to as many of those as possible. Romain, we're really excited to um, have you with us today. I had the privilege of watching you uh, teach a session uh, a few weeks ago, and um, I know you've got some really exciting uh, insights to share with us. So over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Let me share my slides. Okay, let me share my slides. Yeah, this should be the right, right one. Okay. All right, let me pull up the chatting area. So in, in case I can answer your questions. All right, um, good morning. Uh, my name is Roman Tsui. Thank you for attending my webinar and thank you for the uh, Nicholas uh, introduction. So I am going to talk about uh, digital innovations um, in supply chain uh, in today's webinar. So for example, how does digitization fundamentally change supply chains? Um, you know, what is unique about uh, digitization? What are the features there? I'm going to introduce a framework here and go through several examples. Um, so first, let's see supply chain uh, management. Well, good supply chains can make great companies. Uh, for example, Apple. What do you think of Apple, the company? Maybe a lot of people think Apple as a a design company, a, a marketing company. But what um, Apple is really good at is supply chain management. For example, um, in 2005, uh, when Apple introduced a new Apple product called Nano, 
It was revolutionary because Nano used far more flash memory than existing products. And Cook's team predicted that uh, Nano is going to receive tremendous demand. So they prepaid $1.25 billion to suppliers like Samsung to um, corner the market through 2010 on a specific type of memory to secure its competitive advantage in this space, right? And Apple is also very efficient in running its inventories. For example, keeps an average of six days of inventory, whereas the competitors keep hundreds of days of inventory. Um, Apple is also creative in choosing its transportation mold. For example, in 1997, Jobs paid millions of dollars to buy up the available holiday air freight space uh, to make sure that they have enough supply of the iMac products during the holiday season to cover the spike in demand. When most or all of their competitors were manufacturers at that time, they used shipping by sea because it's a cheaper version. But this choice turned out to be uh, very successful. All right, so this, these are examples of Apple, how they manage their inventory and how they manage their supply chains. Another example I want you to think about is Zara. What do you think of Zara about their products? What do you think that they are famous, famous for? And feel free to type you know, in the, you know, the keywords in the chatting area, right, about Zara. They're famous for their speed, very quick, you know, frequent updates of the new products. And they're famous for um, variety, right? Um, you know, a huge variety of, of, of items and they have reasonable price prices, right? Then how does Zara achieve these different things at the same time? Well, first by, you know, a series of their you know, supply chain decisions. They're famous mixed sourcing strategy. That means they outsource the basic items to China to cut cost, and they outsource or insource the productions of the trendy items, the fashionable ones, to Spain in order to achieve speed, right? So, and also they allow their designers and store managers to communicate directly this can significantly help them reduce the lead time. For example, for Zara, the lead time from designing to production to you know, shipping products to stores is only three weeks. Whereas um, the industry average is six months, right? Much, much longer, you know, speed. Another example here is um, Amazon, right? It's basically Amazon is a textbook of, uh, of uh, operations, you know, excellence in how it, you know, manages its warehouses, where to build their warehouses, you know, how to replenish inventory, how much to replenish, and how to do all kinds of deliveries. They are under, you know, careful, you know, calculations and scientific evaluations, right? So, you know, these are all examples of, you know, good supply chains really can help deliver value and help make great companies. And then what's, what is the nature of supply chains then from all of these examples you can see? The supply chain is all about matching supply and demand, right? We have supply, we have demand, how to match them, it could be goods or services, that's supply chain management, right? So, so far we have talked about you know, supply chain, um, but next think about what is digitization, right? Another element of my of my uh, webinar, of my talk is about digitization. What is digitization then? So I want to ask you, what are the key words that come to your mind when we say digitization? And um, blockchain, numbers, when people say numbers, good, great. Any other key words that come to your mind when we say digitization? Digits? I'm moving my analog. Yes, that's true. Seamless, efficiency, visualization, machine, not people, analytics, remote to access technology. All great, all great um, keywords. Those are all different dimensions of, of digitization, right? And essentially, I can um, help summarize all of these keywords, the keywords you've given to me, into two broad categories, two big buckets. 
you are talking about either data or analytics, right? Essentially, digitization is about fundamentally different in the way that uh, we collect data and fundamentally different in the way that we do analytics, essentially. So for example, we now use IoT devices, the mobile devices, smartphones, apps, and sometimes wearable devices to collect data, large volumes of data from different channels, you know, real time, real time data, and data becomes much richer. You know, that's the first, first dimension. And next question is how to extract value from the data? Well, by using analytics. For example, um, AI, machine learning, causal inference, optimization, all of these tools to do what? to provide smart support, smart decisions, um, improve dimensions in different, in different perspectives, right? These are analytics. So some, some companies would call it data-driven um, and intelligence-driven, right? Essentially these two dimensions, data or analytics, you know, digitization is, uh, is about these two dimensions. Next, let's think about then how does digitization change the operation of supply chains, right? I think about, let's try to match digitization into supply chains. So first, first, digitization has enabled us to have a better understanding of supply data and demand data. So know exactly where the suppliers are and where the demands are, maybe at the individual level. That's the first thing, right? Make supply and demand data more fine grind. And also digitization has done what? Enable us to match supply and match demand more accurately and efficiently, right? Essentially it does two things. First, we understand supply and demand better. And second, we can match them better by using analytics. That's how digitization has changed supply chain. Okay, so this is the, you know, the abstract, you know, speaking from a high level, the framework of, uh, of digitization. So next, I want to go over a uh, series of examples um, in different industries. For example, if we think about, think about the taxi industry or delivery industry in general, right? Think about before Uber came along, how does it work in the traditional industry, taxi industry, how does it work? As a customer, do we know where the drivers are in the traditional industry, taxi? Not exactly, right? And as a driver, do you know where the customers are? No. Then what they do is they use their rough estimates to make decisions. For example, drivers tend to wait in areas like popular places, like airports or the shopping malls. And if I am a customer and I walk out of my house, it would be difficult for me to find a taxi unless I make a reservation ahead of time, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can imagine that the utilization rate of the traditional taxi you know, industry, that it would be low and um, the efficiency would be low and the market size would be limited, okay? Now think about Uber, right? Think about how does digitization change this industry? How does, you know, after, you know, Uber comes along, how does, it, how does it work? First of all, with smartphones, they can know exactly where the customers are and the drivers are in real time. You get to keep track of them in real time. And whenever we submit a request to Uber, it usually takes Uber a few seconds to find a driver that best matches our needs, our preferences, our location and our final destination. Right, so see what Uber has done is to first have a better understanding of supply and demand, the data, and second, match them, match them well, more efficiently and accurately, right? And the same idea for the on-demand delivery um, companies like, like Rody, Grubhub, DoorDash, Uber Eats, et cetera. Think about, they all have the, you know, they all have the same, same idea and same logic. And Rody is a um, local Atlanta-based um, startup company, which was um, acquired by UPS last, last year. So what they do is it connects 
um, available you know, drivers to pick up orders from say Walmart or Home Depot and deliver them to end consumers, right? And their core job is to design incentives and operations to attract these different players to their platform and to match them efficiently. That's what they do. And if you think about a lot of the new business models, they are all innovating in the space of data or analytics or both, right? Next, let's think about the examples in the retail, in the retail industry. Now, first, let's think about the online retail, right? The online retail compared to the brick and mortar stores, what additional data now becomes available? What types of data are available in the online channel? Could you please uh, feel free to you know, type uh, the, the keywords in the chatting area? In the online channel, what types of data are available? More specific. Um, data, right? Location about um, about customers, shopping patterns, okay? Inventory, detailed inventory, likes, buyer behavior, search interest, very good, like searching data, browsing history, like click stream data. Very good. You're, you're talking about the area of interest. And that's what, that's something we call customer, strong customer purchasing intent data or digital footprint data, right? Which all of these data probably they were not previously available in the offline channel. And also what customers have put into their shopping cart, right? Browsing history, search history, et cetera. And think about all of these additional you know, detailed data can help us do what? Can support what types of decisions? What types of data-driven decisions? Think about knowing what's important for customers, right? And um, what type of decisions can they support? Inventory planning, okay? And think about how differently compared to the previous decisions, right? Customer interest, you can show promotions, more customized, personalized, real-time and dynamic promotions you can provide to customers, right? Staffing, staffing decisions, uh, much more dynamic and real-time uh, staffing decisions, accurate staffing decisions you can make, right? And um, in terms of inventory replenishment, think about, think about this. If the retailer, you know, detects that a lot of the local, you know, customers, for example, in Atlanta area, a lot of the customers have uh, added certain items to their shopping cart. Then what the retailer can do is that they can pre-ship the products to the local areas, you know, warehouses at the local areas. And this, they can probably use some of their idle capacity in advance to ship the products here. So can re reduce their shipping cost to some extent, smooth out their shipment. And in the same time, if a customer actually places an order, um, their shipment, you know, in their speed would be very fast, right? So it, it's sort of like it creates a win-win situation for both customers and for, and for the retailer as well, right? And um, another example is think about the procurement, procurement decision. So previously, previously procurement decisions are based on what? What customers have purchased? And what customers are purchased, they're limited by what? What you offer to them, right? So it, um, how you want to expand your, your portfolio, your, your, your product lines, it's not um, kind of a trivial or efficient decision for them to make, right? And now think about with the searching history, right? Essentially, customers can tell, can signal what they demand, what they want, but probably what you do not carry. And now you can capture this piece of information and you can use this to help you support your own procurement, procurement decisions, right? So in a sense that we can see that data can help us improve our operations, cut costs and improve customer experience. Really a win-win situation here, right? 
And um, in retail, you know, warehouse and logistics management is also critical. And this is something that, um, for example, warehouse management they're trying to push is fully automation in each step, in each process, all the way from receiving to uh, picking, to packing, labeling, scanning, and shipping. They want to automate um, all spectrums, all processes, right? To improve efficiency of managing um, warehouses. And for example, and for example, I went to, here, let me show you. I went to the, probably you also know, we have a called Moldex show, uh, I think last week in Atlanta, uh, which essentially is an industry trade show about um, automation in uh, warehouses in, in logistics. And here are just some examples that I've, I've seen at the, at the show where you can see the state of art you know, technology or state of art um, automation in the space of, uh, of uh, material handling um, space. What they're really trying to push now, I see a lot of you know, you know, manufacturers and companies they're pushing um, is what they call autonomous mobile robot. A, they're pushing for the technology like smart navigation um, so that when you, when you travel, when you, you know, travel to your final destination, you do not need labels to guide you through and smooth, really smooth movement. Because what if you are, you are, you are carrying like liquid, right? Very smooth movement, what they're um, pushing for. And also, you know, smartly detect obstacles um, and uh, to uh, avoid them, all right? Okay, so, and here, let me use an example of, of, uh, of JD. Let's see JD's um, kind of performances. JD, by the way, is the second largest online retailer um, in China. And um, it has, I know it has made a lot of um, big innovations in the space of, you know, big data, supply chain, and automation like driverless car and Zhong and fully automated warehouses, which has helped JD cut cost quite significantly. For example, um, although their sales increased by eight times in the last few years and their product variety expanded significantly, JD managed to keep almost the same days of inventory um, over time. And, um, you know, around 36 days of inventory. And um, for example, Amazon keeps you know, 60 days of inventory. Um, so JD is very efficient in keeping and uh, running his um, inventory. And in terms of the fulfillment cost, you can see it has been you know, reducing over, over, over the years because of all of these you know, digitization um, automation that they have implemented um, at, um, their, in, throughout their supply chains. Okay. Another example I want to discuss with you is how digitization in the service industry, um, specifically the robots in the service industry. So have you seen this type of robots at, for example, um, hotels or restaurants? This one? And let me show you one example. I've been to, um, there is a restaurant called Good Harvest on the Billford Highway. And um, I saw that they have these type of, you can call them service robots or collaborative robots, you know, that delivers food um, within that restaurant. Have you seen those type of rest, uh, robots? Right, you know, the server load like dishes to the robots and robots would go and deliver. See, they can detect people, right? And they arrive at the table. Right? And customers would unload their dishes, where you can call a server to unload the dishes.
the name of the restaurant is called Good Harvest on the Bilford Highway. Good Harvest on the Bilford Highway. See, they're unloading it. And it saves all of the travel, you know, time of the service. And you know, you know, the especially in the service industry, you know, restaurant, there is a huge labor shortage in this space. And uh, the salary increase, you know, is very, very high. Um, so the cost, labor cost here is, you know, increasing like crazy. So that's why I know a lot of restaurants, they're thinking about adopting robots like this, right? Now the robot is coming back. All right. So I think this week, so yesterday, oh, on Monday, I took this robot, actually. This is called Bella Bot, uh, particularly this robot. I took this robot and I, um, oh, in here it is. And I took it to my class, my MBA class, um, Operation Strategy to the Ghost Weta Business School. And here's in my class, I'm trying to demonstrate how to deliver a beverage to, to the customer. And you take it, then they have four sensors there to sense that, oh, the beverage is gone and they're ready to you know, go back. And going back. All right. So think about, I wonder, as a customer, right, as a customer, how would you value, you know, these type of robots, the service of these robots in restaurants? Do you think that they are going to be very useful, very valuable as a customer yourself? No tips. I thought about this too. Um, perhaps, you know, you know, this could indicate that you can you know, reduce the you know, amount of tips you, you provide so it can save, save cost from the customer, from the customer side. And also from the restaurant side, they can also, you know, reduce cost. Okay, but perhaps think about maybe what are the potential risks for a restaurant to adopt robot servers, or maybe this is the future. Right, impersonal um, customer experience. Absolutely, I agree. These probably would not be suitable for all types of restaurants. Um, high end, maybe not, definitely not suitable because you're 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 looking for good customer services. I had high-end restaurants. And um, extremely like fast, fast food probably would not be a, 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 a good, you know, pseudo place either because customers, they expect to grab their own food, right? Spills and mistakes, right? That's another, um, you know, type of risk. That's the robot accept verbal comments, say your food is not correct. I think that's the next, um, you know, it's the space needs a lot of uh, development, right? How to interact with human. Okay, all right. So the example of digitization in the service, in the service industry. All right, how about next, I wanna give you another example about digitization in the art space. Anybody knows this person? Do you know, you know who he is and what, what he did? Everybody knows, knows him? Rembrandt Van Rijn? Right. You can perhaps pause now and uh, search for his name. Yes, it's an artist. He's an artist. He's a Dutch. He's a Dutch painter. Um, it's a very famous one, and he was considered as one of the greatest visual artists in the history of art. His work depict, uh, depicted a lot of the portraits and self-portraits. And he died three hundred years ago. And now the question is, can we use analytics to create a new painting? by Rembrandt, right? Here is a video that I wanna to show to you. 
One of his great achievements, one of Rembrandt's great achievements, was to portray human emotions in a much more convincing way than artists had before him, and in many ways for all time. At ING, we believe in the power of innovation, what it can mean to people. We want to bring this innovative spirit to our sponsorship of Dutch art and culture. We knew that for this challenge, we needed to team up with experts from various fields to make this come to life. We're using a lot of data to improve business life. But we haven't been using data that much in a way that touches the human soul. You could say that we use technology and data like Rembrandt used his paints and his brushes to create something new. The first step was to study the works of Rembrandt in order to create an extensive database. We gathered the data from his collection of paintings from many different sources, including 3D scans and upscale images using a deep learning algorithm. Because a significant percentage of Rembrandt paintings were portraits, we analyzed the demography of the faces in these paintings, looking at factors like gender, age, and head direction. The data led us to the conclusion that the subject should be a portrait of a Caucasian male with facial hair between 30 and 40 years old, in dark clothing with a collar, wearing a hat, and facing to the right. From there, we started to extract features only with faces that were related to that specific profile. And we had to create a whole painting from just data. And we used uh, statistical analysis and various algorithms to extract the features that make Rembrandt Rembrandt. We took parts of the face and we started to compare them. And then, based on this, we were able to create a typical Rembrandt eye or nose or mouth or ear. After generating the features, we were focusing on the face proportions. We used an algorithm that can detect over 60 points in a painting. We were able to align the faces and to estimate the distance between the eyes, the nose and the mouth and the ears. A painting is not a 2D picture, it's 3D. You can see the canvas, you can see the process, and that's what makes the painting come alive. A hive map is essential to make the painting a painting. We incorporated the hive map into the painting and printed on a 3D printer that uses a special paint-based UV ink. It printed many layers, one on top of the other, which resulted in the height and texture of the final painting. sometimes a magical moment to see a painting for the first time. Even if it's computer generated, for me it is something special. I would have believed if I would saw it in a museum that it would have been a, a real Rembrandt, uh, just one I haven't seen before. It will be interesting to see Rembrandt looking at it. He will be happy that there are people trying to understand him and trying to create something out of that. So I think he will be happy. The next Rembrandt makes you think about where innovation can take us. What's next? Sorry. Um, so if analytics can paint a Rembrandt, then who knows what analytics can do for our business, right? All right, here I wanna share with you, um, you know, it's the result of a survey uh, my colleagues uh, at the Harvard Business School ha have conducted. So what was the um, survey about? Essentially, they ask companies, you know, hundreds of, uh, you know, detailed questions about data and analytics and create an analytics score for each company based on their answers. Um, and here are the results. So, so basically, the, in four um, industries, finance, retail, manufacturing, and consumer goods. They're all leaders, you know, in, in, in different areas. 
And we can essentially rank them to a top performers and bottom performers. And it, it, as you can see, the bottom performers on average, they use less data, very limited use of advanced analytics. They use packaged software instead of self-development and their performances on average are lower in terms of the revenue per employee, gross margin, operating margin. Whereas if you look at the top performers in terms of the analytics score, they use much more data, a lot of real-time predictive and analytics, more custom software, right? More state-of-art, cutting-edge technologies in this space, and their profitability is much better, right? In terms of the gross margin, operating margin, net income, et cetera. And um, they, these leaders are doing uh, differently with analytics, right? For example, you know, in terms of the customer relationship management, human capital management, um, operations and product development, analytics and digitization have helped them improve their performances on these scales. And I want you to think about your own experiences, you know, your own experiences at companies where the industry, thinking about their data, right? Software and analytics tools, think about the, the digital transformation. Do you think that your observation is consistent with the numbers here, the improvement? Right. All right. So what I want you to show here is what analytics can do to business and the value of digitization, right? And digital um, transformation. So um, do we have enough time? We still have some time. Yes. Yeah. All right. So next, what I wanted to do is maybe I want to take, you know, talk about one example of my um, kind of, to give you an example of my research uh, experience in the space of logistics and digitization. Um, so let's now shift our focus on logistics a little bit where, you know, logistics, if you think about it, is an important part of daily operations. It's a, it's a trillion dollar industry that accounts for a significant percentage of GDP in, you know, I think in a lot of countries. So logistics is important for both the economy and for businesses. For example, James Heskett, a former HBS professor, once said in an HBR article called Logistics Essential to Strategy that logistics can spell the difference between success and failure in businesses. He highlights a key point that logistics really you know, they're critical to companies and they should, companies should factor logistics into the integral design of their strategy. Especially if you think about online, you know, buying online retail, logistics is critical, right? Because that's the time when customers get to receive, you know, the physical product, delivering products to customers, right? It's the time they get to receive the product and they'll get to experience the service for, you know, the first time so that delivering products to customers in a timely and reliable manner really matters to customers. It can enhance customers' experience and improve a company's retention rate and profitability, right? And the question is, think about is, to what extent do customers care about delivery in the online space? And what would be the value of good deliveries to, to companies, to, to retail platforms? And I happen to have a, a research in this space that uh, quantifies the value of delivery uh, to retail platforms. Now, basically long story short, what happened was there was a fight uh, between two business giants in China. Uh, they're Alibaba and SF Express. I guess that probably you all know Alibaba. It is the largest retail platform in China has the almost same GMV as Amazon. SF Express, on the other hand, is the largest private carrier in China. It's like UPS in China, and it is best known for its highest service quality. In fact, it has been ranking the first in customer sat satisfaction for years, ever since it was, it was founded. And it is the best along a lot of dimensions, like speed, reliability, you know, professionalism. 
And um, the relationship between these two is very like Amazon and UPS. They have been close partners for years. But because of some data, you know, sharing conflict between the two, these two suddenly broke up in uh, June 2017, around that time. And as a result, SF Express was removed as a shipping option from Alibaba's platform for 42 hours and then resumed. So you can imagine that it's like UPS removed from Amazon's platform for 42 hours and then resumed. And during this time period, the customers, you know, third-party sellers on Alibaba, none of them could have access to SF Express you know, services. They basically cannot use this you know, carrier to ship out products. And you can imagine that if I am a, I am a customer and I'm buying very expensive items like a TV, probably only trust SF to ship my valuable products to me, right? And if when SF is gone, you know, customers, what would be the reactions to customers? That's something that I want to quantify here. So then what I do is I um, use a econometrics model and I took Alibaba's about 14 million transactions. So what do I find? I find that Alibaba's sales went down by 14% when SF was gone. And the sales actually resumed when SF, um, their collaboration was, was resumed, right? And the question is, where did the sales go? And I found that with large probability, a lot of this lost sales, they went to Alibaba's key competitors like JD, yeah, which is Alibaba's worst nightmare. Right. It seems that the customers were disappointed by, you know, you know, the the quality of the service of uh, Alibaba's other carriers when SF was not there. So they went to other retailers to purchase elsewhere. Then what does this tell us? This tells us that delivery matters a lot. Turns out it is a big factor in e-commerce and customers are quite sensitive to delivery quality when they shop online, okay? It's just an example that I wanna to show to you is how you know, we can you know, um, use data and analytics to help us quantify the value of, uh, of uh, delivery. In um, another research um, that I've done in this retail um, and in the logistics space is a collaboration with, with Sinel where we evaluate the value of last mile delivery. So, you know, what is Hainel and how does it work? So Hainel basically is the largest logistics platform in, in China that connects hundreds of carriers. And to give you a sense of the volume of Hainel, the scale of Hainel, Hainel processes 50 million packages per day and UPS, you know, processes 21 million, right? To give a scale, it's a huge, huge scale of Hainel. And Cainiao has these small stores where we, what they call Cainiao stations. Um, it's like Amazon lockers, but they are, you know, storefront and has usually one or two employees there where they are located in residential areas. Um, and they serve as a drop off and pick up locations for, for these, you know, delivery companies they would uh, drop off their packages there and customers would go and pick up um, their items and, you know, you know, and, and then you know, uh, go home. So you know, the, and the location of these um, um, stations, they are about 100 to 500 meters to customers' homes. This is very, very close. But customers, they do their own jobs of the last mile delivery. So here are my pictures of the stations, hand now stations where uh, the bottom one actually there, uh, he's my PhD student. He spent the last half a, uh, half a year at Sanyao um, to do this uh, project, this research. So what they wanna um, evaluate is, what if we offer the last mile home delivery service to customers? What if they push this service to customers? Of course, they will incur additional costs, but what are the benefits to customers? Then what we did is we um, conducted uh, a field experiment over the last 50 month, where for some of the stores, some of the uh, Sinel stations, um, we allow last mile home delivery 
to customers. We give this option to customers. So customers do not need to go and pick up the items. And turns out, turns out the value of this last mile delivery is that the sales actually increased by 18.6%, right? It's quite significant. And if we do a valuation of the benefit over the cost, the benefit is $1.86, approximately speaking, per order. And the cost, if you need to hire labor, hire people to do this last mile delivery, the cost per order would be $1.5 all in RMB. So, but again, you can see the benefit outweighs the cost. So it makes sense for China to go with this, go with this decision. So here is another example I want to show to you is how we use um, field experiment or we call that A-B test to help support decisions of this sort, whether to um, you know, go with the last mile delivery. All right. And um, I want to um, here. I let me skip this example. I want to have enough time to you know answer potential questions from you. Um, just as a summary, I think the key point of uh, my uh, webinar today is to you know showcase some examples of uh, digitization in different spaces and the um, great opportunities digitization has bring to companies, and uh, specifically showcase uh, two of my research products in the space of delivery and logistics, the value of delivery to, to the retail platforms um, and how much customers value um, such services. So any questions? So Romain, we have uh, one question that was submitted via the Q&A box, and I have a question that was sent to me privately. So uh, the first one is with all the great examples that you were sharing earlier in your webinar session, they seem to emphasize just in time inventory management like Amazon's six and a half or 6.4 days, if you will, of inventory. Um, and that model did work well in a more stable and predictable world. And yet we're in a very volatile and uncertain time right now. Uh, don't we need more redundancy and more stored inventory to have the more robust supply chains versus just-in-time supply chain. I uh, totally agree. I agree with you um, in the sense that this, we have discussed, you know, these questions in class as well, especially I think during pandemic, the uncertainty increases and in supply chain, it's just something we call the bullwhip effect. Mm -hmm. Really a small fluctuation in the downstream you know, a uh, retailer would cause huge fluctuations in the entire supply chain. And fluctuations, uncertainties means what? You have to build redundancy in your inventory. That's something we call safety stock. And I do ag agree with you. In space of high uncertainties, we need to build extra, extra inventory in our, in our system, in our supply chains to hedge against the potential risk of running out of uh, stock, right out of inventory. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right. Yeah, and then um, another question that was submitted is, will logistics be different in metaverse since everything is already done online? Uh, metaverse, um, <laughs> so here's the thing. <laughs> Even if things are online, we still need to interact with the physical space, physical world, and that means what? What you eat, what you wear, right? and what you buy from online retailers. And think about the background operations. How do you get the items that needs operations, that needs logistics? So because, this is a very good point. I think because more and more people, especially with pandemic, a lot of people are purchasing online. The online sales volume actually increased significantly during pandemic. Because of that, logistics becomes even more important. And I know, um, especially um, I know, for example, local in local areas, a lot of new warehouses are being built, right? Mm -hmm. Logistics um, centers are being built. So it means that um, in, you know, increasing demand in the space um, and increasing, I think, demand of uh, technology and uh, skills in this space. Yeah, interesting. Um, and then we have one last question and then I've got the one that was sent to me. Um, so how universal is the value of last mile delivery? Do you think 
different customers' markets or products may showcase that the last mile delivery has no value. Are there any exceptions to the conclusions you've reached in your research? I agree. Let me go back to my earlier slide. Hmm. I do agree. Uh, the value of delivery, last mile delivery, can be differentiated uh, across industries mm -hmm. and across and across across companies, right? And across places, for example, this is an example in China where labor cost is not that high yet. So it makes sense to do this last mile delivery for them as people, human. Who, who, who do the job, it makes sense for them. And for the benefit and cost analysis, you can see, you know, it makes sense to adopt this strategy, but it doesn't mean, for example, in the US, it makes sense. For example, Amazon Locker, I would not see value in uh, doing the last mile delivery because it depends on what, as a, it's a function of the local customer density. If the density is high enough, probably it makes sense, mm -hmm. right? I can drop off, multiple orders on each route. For example, in areas like maybe New York or in some er other areas, it makes sense. But maybe in Atlanta, it does not make much of a sense. We don't have enough density in our demand to do last mile delivery. And in this space, last mile delivery, I saw in the chatting area, someone mentioned neural, right? A lot of the startups and technologies here are being developed. The, um, the delivery of robots, right? Mm -hmm. If the last mile delivery can be achieved by robots automation, then they can save us a lot of the cost here. And then the last mile delivery, and it makes sense for a lot of you know industries and companies. Yeah. We have an attendee that has, a, this is a really provocative question. Are there, are you aware of any uh, examples of how increased data use has actually reduced the carbon footprint in supply chains? Carbon that might be an interesting uh, conversation with the Goizueta, uh Business and Society Institute, right? I remember, I remember seeing this research. Um, I remember seeing this research. You know, you know, in, in the sense that, for example, I've seen several research showing that Uber, with the adoption of Uber, um, has significantly helped reduce. Um, uh, po pollutions and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Uber is an example of uh, of, of, of new technology and uh, digitization and analytics, right? Mm -hmm. um, so it shows that technology can significantly um, improve our our environment. Yeah. So I want to return back to a, a question got sent to me rooming earlier in the session. Uh, when you were talking about the robots, and there was a curiosity around how much how much might one of these cost, for example, a restaurant to use, uh, in you know versus a human. So, do you have any insight into how much that might cost? Sorry, just a second. let me share. Um, so, for example, it depends on the different uh, revenue model of these robot uh, pro providers companies. So I know some of them may charge a down payment of uh, a few thousand dollars for uh, maybe three, four thousand dollars, mm -hmm. and uh, monthly basis they you, you and, and then charge you um, a all the way to three hundred to eight hundred dollars per month, right? Um, as the rental uh, mm -hmm. okay. term, um, so. But if you think, and I know for some companies, they don't charge a, a, a down payment, but directly charge maybe around $800 per month. But if you think that cost with respect to the cost of hiring a server is still, you know, makes a lot of sense. And um, according to my um, um, analysis and my observation, a robot equals around 0.75 human labor. Um, in a restaurant. So, and I know, for example, the servers now, they, their salary is really 
was increasing a lot and they would request a minimum of $200 per day um, from the restaurant. If they don't have, you know, receive enough tips, then the restaurant have to pay them in order to pay them $200 per day and just do the calculation. And there you can see the robot is way, way cheaper than uh, human labor. And it doesn't mean that the robot will completely replace human. It's more like you still need a, a human there to work with the robot, right? To, 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 to serve, to do all of the delivery, um, food and payment and, and stuff. And it's a matter of um, how well human can work together with the robot to not only improve the efficiency of the entire restaurant, also improve the efficiency of the human server. Mm, okay. And that makes a lot of sense, especially with the examples that, that you shared. Yeah. Well, Rumeng, thank you so much. We want to make sure and get everyone out on time. Um, but I do want to share just a couple of things, especially what Nicola mentioned at the introduction of our webinar today. Um, so, oh, just one moment, please. My screen share was not working there. Um, we are looking forward, as Nicola mentioned earlier, we are, uh, let's see, let me get back up here. There we go. Uh, looking forward to what's coming next with our business over breakfast sessions coming up. So on April the 21st, so two weeks from today, we welcome Dan McCarthy, and he's going to be looking at our COVID-induced lifestyle changes. Are those actual habits or is it just a trend? And then in May, we are excited to welcome back to the camera, if you will, um, an, an update or a revisit on the economy and me with our friends Tom Smith and Bill McKinnon. Um, what, what's going on in the market today? How is that affecting us and what might be ahead? And on the 19th, Rajiv Garg will join us for the rise of virtual social technologies. And as Nicola mentioned uh, earlier in our session today, we've got some exciting things coming. And I'd like to highlight just a couple of those. One is AI machine learning with Jesse Boxted coming up this summer and our extending learning courses where you can be in the actual MBA classroom. If you are not yet ready to commit to a full graduate degree, you can receive degree credits for these courses. So those will be up on our website soon. Uh, feel free to check out our website, reach out to Tammy Long, her email address is here if you'd like to have more information. So Romain, thanks again so much for sharing your research and insight with us this morning. And thank you to all of you for joining us. We love having you joining us on the first and third Thursday each month. And for those who are on uh, a browser, you will likely see a survey pop up. We'd love to hear your key takeaways from today's session and any other feedback you'd like to share. Thanks so much and have a great rest of the day. Thank you.